Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Layla, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Erin. I'm really excited to be here. I'd love to start with you introducing yourself to our listeners in your own way. This story of your life, I think, would really uh, be wonderful for you to share. So I am a writer and a speaker and a teacher and a podcast host as well. You know, in order to understand how I got to the point of writing my book, Me and White Supremacy, I think it's really important to understand the context of my identities and my experiences. I sit at very different intersections. I'm I'm what you call third culture kid or third culture adult now. So my mother is from, both of my parents are from East Africa. My mother is from Zanzibar. My dad is from Kenya. They have roots um, in the Middle East, in Oman, uh, but they met in Wales in the would be late 70s, uh, where they were both there for studies and they met each other, married, had children, had me and my two younger brothers. And so we grew up in Wales initially as black Muslim children in a predominantly white space. And also uh, my parents sent us to Catholic schools uh, because they felt that the education and the discipline was better. Um, so we also grew up as often the sole Muslims in uh, Roman Catholic schools. And my experiences as a child growing up in Wales for a short time, then my parents uh, moved us to Africa, lived there for a little while, then we moved back to Wales, and then we moved to England. And so that was my life up until about 15 years old. And then when I was 15, we moved to where I live now, which is Qatar in the Middle East. And so I've had so many different types of experiences. And in all of those places, been really aware of but not really able to articulate what it meant to have identities that were other. And that has really framed my uh, kind of how I sit in the world and how I see the world. But that being said, race and identity was not something that I was writing about or actively thinking about until just a couple of years ago. I've had a very long and varied career, you could say, but in 2014, I decided to start working for myself. And so I started out as a coach. I was trained as a coach and I was doing life coaching and then business coaching with a kind of spiritual kind of aspect to it. And I was in a, you know, in the industry of online business, which at the time I had not realized even though I was aware of it, but not consciously aware of it. I hadn't realized how very white that industry is, the online business area, the industry of wellness and personal growth and spirituality is very white. It's predominantly white. It's very rare to find uh, black people and people of color being represented, being uplifted, being highlighted and being seen as leaders and, you know, having that credibility. Leading up to the US 2016 elections, I had a lot of peers and clients who were American, because those industries are also very heavily American, uh, North American. And so, you know, conversations around politics, and then also around feminism and around race were really coming more into my consciousness. And I was really paying attention to new kinds of conversations that I hadn't heard before. And it was really, it was really giving me a sense of clarity around the industry that I was in and things that I was seeing, behaviors, attitudes, practices, policies, unconscious biases, that were present that I had kind of put my blinders on to seeing um, that I was now becoming very aware of. After the elections, the Charlottesville rally happened and I remember seeing it, you know, I'm, I'm halfway across the world, but I remember seeing the images on the internet of these white men marching with these torches and shouting and screaming racist and anti-Semitic slogans and something about the look of like just pure hatred in their eyes just triggered something really deep within me. And I was pulled to, literally pulled to my laptop to sit and write something. It was like something had snapped inside of me and the the months of these conversations around race, something finally tipped over inside of me and I was ready to say something about it. And so I wrote an open letter, which I addressed to the people who are in my industry, who are uh, primarily white women, spiritual white women. And the letter was called, I need to talk to spiritual white women about white supremacy. And to my complete shock, the letter went very viral. 
I had a very small following. I was just building a very small business very slowly. And suddenly I had this huge influx of people because of this article, which just either resonated so deeply with it, with people or for some people really offended, upset, um, angered some people. And it initiated me into this public conversation around race, but I was also still kind of navigating my own, my own understanding of it and how I felt about it and what I was experiencing uh, within it. And so it was a very tumultuous time because I was having very public conversations every day with white people and people who hold white privilege around race, racism, white supremacy, as it was showing up in our spaces. And it was creating a lot of white fragility within the people who were, you know, hearing it. And, and I was basically very burnt out from it. And at the same time, as I said, I was, I was going through my own process of awakening, really coming to terms with what it meant for me to be a black woman in this industry. I had to do a lot of processing around that. A few months later, realized I was reaching burnout. And so I had to stop working with a mentor to help me find my, you know, to help me with the processing and to help me find a way back to showing up in my work in a way that felt right and true for me, where I could kind of find my own voice in, in how I wanted to do this work. And at that time, I wasn't really, you know, I was having very public conversations around race and, and white supremacy, but I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't like I'm an educator, I'm a teacher in this. I was just a, a voice that had happened to attract a lot of um, people. And then one night, uh, it was almost a year ago now, I was trying to go to sleep and I started reflecting on how different it was now that when I was speaking online with people about white supremacy, pe white people were able to hear the conversation in a way that they hadn't before. And it was, I just really got curious around, I wonder what they have learned in this time from when I published that letter initially, the spiritual white women letter initially versus now months later, how come there is more willingness to hear it? How come there's more comfortability with these terms? I wonder what has been learned in this time. And so I started sort of writing things on my phone and this whole me and white supremacy challenge came to me in the space of a, an hour or two. And I wrote everything down, kind of all these prompts and then posted it online that same night it was around 3 a.m. And I said, we start tomorrow. This is what we're doing. We're going to be doing this 28 day challenge uh, for people with white privilege to explore, you know, what have you learned about you and white supremacy and what have you learned about your complicity in white supremacy? And then I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning and I was like, what have I done? <laughs> I wasn't, I hadn't really thought it through. I hadn't, it was kind of, you know, my mentor calls it moving at the speed of inspiration. It kind of came through me and I put it out. And I, I know that if I had waited until the next day to post about it, I probably wouldn't have posted about it because I hadn't thought about what level of emotional labor is that going to take? What could the repercussions be? What could the consequences be? How might it be for other uh, Black people and, and Indigenous people of color to witness that kind of a public conversation? I, can, I hadn't really forethought all of those things through but you know I put it out there and so I was like okay we start today day one and we started having this conversation each day exploring an aspect of white supremacy that I had seen witnessed experienced that made up this thing called white supremacy and the premise behind it was you know it's often talked about in this really intellectualized theorized kind of way and what I was wanting was for people to really explore on a personal level, inside you, inside your mind, inside your heart, like your personal actions, how is this showing up for you? And what is your relationship with this? And how can we, how can you as an individual unpack it rather than thinking it's something outside of yourself? And again, as a, as a complete surprise to me, that challenge itself went very viral. In not having thought it through, I kind of thought, oh, this will probably lose me followers. This will probably be something that not many people take part in thousands of people took part in it. And it again ignited this really a cultural movement in a way of hashtag me and white supremacy and looking at what is my personal relationship with white supremacy. And so when I finished the challenge, I realized this is more than just an Instagram thing. I mean, I realized that pretty quickly. I think by day, by the end of day one, I was like, this is a lot, this is big. And so I realized it needed to become a book. And so at the end of last year, so November 2018, I released it as a free digital workbook 
that took the 28 day process that I had run on Instagram, but expanded it since I wasn't constrained by the you know, word limit of the social media platform. And it's reached 100,000 people almost at this stage. And, and now it's, it's uh, becoming a traditionally published book. So it's being published by Sourcebooks in North America and by Quirkus Books in the UK. It comes out on February 4th of 2020. So it's been this like really, just like, you know, the way that my identities are like so strange and so different and I've lived here, but I'm from there, but I do this, you know, me and white supremacy has developed in that same kind of way where how it began and where it's gone to, I could never have envisioned it, but it's had such an amazing impact in the world. And I've been really grateful to hear from people who are working with the workbook, not just individually, but in groups, because I, I you know, lay out a process sharing the work of um, the circle way in the book where I talk about how to do this work if you're wanting to do it in groups. And I could never have envisioned that it would go beyond sort of like just personal, you know, book clubs or friend groups. It's gone into corporations, into universities, into nonprofit groups. You know, I've had people email me and say, oh, this is actually a part of our training. Like the part of our orientation is we have to work through the 28 day workbook. And that has been just incredible. I came to learning about your work through the Me and White Supremacy workbook that I downloaded and congratulations on turning it into a book. Thank you. So thank you for that story. I loved how you put moving at the speed of inspiration. And Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to ask us to move into a space of talking about some of the terms in the book, just so we can have listeners be on the starting point of shared language. and, And particularly if there are any terms that you feel like you want to bring into this conversation right now that are particularly uh, you're paying attention to maybe in in your work or in your life right now. Can you define some terms for our listeners so we can start the conversation there? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because I, um, so the original workbook has been expanded even more now and will be the published book that's in that's, that's published in 2020. And I was, you know, when I initially sort of channeled the, the Instagram challenge, the terms are kind of, you know, terms which you can find out on the internet. There's nothing in there that I've invented that's brand new, but I laid them out in a process where I wanted people to go from terms that maybe we're more familiar with to then terms that you may not be as familiar with. So in that first week, in those first seven days, we cover what I've talked about in the book to come now as kind of like, these are like the basics, right? These are the terms that you've probably heard. You've probably heard the term white privilege. You've probably heard the term white fragility. If you haven't, this is where we're starting, right? And so with white privilege and and white fragility, those are two terms that were coined, white privilege was coined by Peggy McIntosh, where she talked about this invisible knapsack of unearned advantages that come only because of skin color. Um, and with white fragility, that's a term coined by Robin DiAngelo, who's written um, an amazing book called White Fragility. And she talks about it as this inability for white people to have conversations about race without becoming, without basically falling apart. I wanted people to start at that kind of base level. But then as the days and the sort of weeks go in, you, we start looking at things which are not as obvious. So things like white apathy which describes a kind of feeling of like, well, this is the way just things are and it's too much and I don't really have the bandwidth for it right now to think about anti-racism. And it's that feeling of like this, I understand this is an issue, but it's just not a big enough issue for me to have to think about. Mm -hmm. And I talk about how each of these things individually might not even seem like that bad, But when you start really following it through, if you start with a sense of, yeah, I get this as a priority, but I'll make it, I have other things which are priority right now and I'll get to it when I have the time that really keeps white supremacy in place. It's not, it's not a neutral thing. It might feel neutral because you're not doing anything actively, outwardly, externally bad, quote unquote, but it's the non-action that actually maintains the status quo. There are other things that I talk about in the book, like white saviorism, which seems like a, an actually good thing. So it's this like, okay, I want to help black indigenous people of color. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to 
change things and I'm going to help these poor people. And I'm, you know, and that seems like a good thing on the surface, right? It's like, okay, so I'm actually going to take action. It's actually a good thing. But the reason why it contributes to white supremacy is that it's often based on the idea that as we build up through the other prompts that come before it, this idea that if you haven't examined what your actual stereotypes are and your actual thoughts are around black indigenous people of color, then you're coming in to help a group of people who you see as less than you and who you see as less capable than you. And if you see people as, as less than you and less capable than you, the approach to which you're going to be doing that work is going to be very patronizing. It's going to be very paternalistic. It's going to have an air of colonialism about it. And instead of asking that group of people, what do you need? It, it often involves, I'm going to come into this community and I'm going to save this community. Um, and that just continues to contribute to this idea of white supremacy, white supremacy being that that one race is superior to another. And so what I do through this process is start people off in that first week with kind of like the baseline basics. Okay, here's what we know. Here's what we, here are the more obvious things. And then as we go through each day and each week, we become, we really start looking at the more nuanced things, the more nuanced terms, and they make more sense because we already did the basics. If you just jump in and start looking at like white apathy without an understanding of the basics, it, it just, it doesn't hit in the same way. You don't, you don't have that sense of urgency of why this is really important. And so what I'm hoping that the book does is it gives people who are new to this work, a set of terms and a set of understandings and a way of understanding it within themselves and a way of seeing it when they, when they notice it uh, in other people. And for people who are more familiar with these terms, I hope that it's going to offer an even greater depth of understanding on those terms. And I know that there are also many Black Indigenous people of color who have read the book and who are using the book and recommending it to, to other white people. And, I, and I, the feedback that I've received from them is that it's given them a, a way to be able to have these conversations with the white people in their life as well. I'm just curious, are, are there any stories that come to mind or pop up from all the words that have been spoken on your Instagram channel and your social media channels, or maybe talk about some of the the tension around how it was received, both in fostering that depth of understanding, but also maybe in some of the ways that, you know, white apathy or posturing showed up in in that challenge. Because I think it's, it's important for listeners to just sense the breadth of response that occurred or emerged. Yeah. I think that The thing to understand about this work is that it is very confronting. It asks you to look directly at yourself, and that's never comfortable, regardless of the topic. That's never comfortable. And we were also doing it on a public platform. There was no, there was no safety. You know, it was on a public platform. There was no sign up or anything. People, it was free. People could join or not join. Um, but my, my requirement was that if you joined, that you really did do the work and you really did the you dug deep and you didn't um, play around because I was reading through each of those comments every day and I could tell who were the people who were just showing up to do it so that they could say they've done it and say I'm a good ally versus the people who were really like let me really dig deep within me um, and really pull out what the truth is. And, you know, with some people, I had to really encourage them. I would read what they would say, and I would say, I, I, I feel like you're not going deep enough here, or I feel like you're really saying at an intellectual level, you're talking about white people broadly, but you're not talking about yourself. Um, and if you're talking about yourself, you're not really giving, you're not revealing a lot, right? And I wasn't looking for gratuitous confessions of guilt. That isn't what this work is about at all. But what this work is about is the benefit that you get out of this work will only be as deep as how willing you are to go within the work. My commitment was that I said, I would do this for 28 days. I'm here. I'm doing it. I have this responsibility. If I'm going to be doing this, then you need to show up. Like that's the best way that you can repay me for this labor is for you to show up and not mess around. It was a challenge because it was a lot of people it was a challenge because people were at different levels of their engagement with anti-racism work and social justice. There were times when I I really had to like, I I mean, I'm, I'm just reflecting on, there was a time when I actually had to step away for a day or two and say, we need to take a pause because there were people who were 
you know, commenting who really, you know, a lot of what I was talking about in the challenge is what was showing up. So a lot of anti-blackness, a lot of misogynoir, which is the, uh, is, which is where anti-blackness and misogyny meet. So be- specifically because I'm a black w- woman, I face certain things and, and I'm seen in a certain way. There were things that were coming up around people thinking that I had some sort of ulterior motive for why I was doing that work. There were people who felt like my intention was to kind of brainwash people or that my intention was to get a mass number of people to feel guilt and shame about themselves, which wasn't uh, at all my intention. And so it was, it was really difficult. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. It was really, really hard. What kept me in it was that there were people who were showing up to do the work. What kept me in it was that I had made a commitment and the commitment wasn't that I was, I'm going to keep a commitment to other people. It was that I made this commitment to myself and it was really important for me to follow through. And also what kept me going was there were so many black indigenous people of color, especially black women who were showing up in that space and being really supportive for me and really holding that space voluntarily, you know, really helping sort of as co-teachers to take people deeper. And I really felt a sense of commitment to them that we've started this really heavy work and it needs to, we need to see it through to the end. You know, I talked about right at the beginning how with this work, it's not something I chose because it's not easy work. It's, it's really not easy work. Um, and it takes a lot out of you. And I've had to find my way of doing it where I'm not self-sacrificing or martyring myself. But I have come to an, an understanding and an acceptance that when you do this kind of work, that it's going to cause certain types of reactions within people. And that is part of the responsibility that I have said yes to taking on. Um, and it's always, a, it's always a balance between how, okay, I accept that that's going to happen, but how, am I gonna, how do I choose to then respond to it so that I'm centering myself? And that's been a, that's been a, that challenge really taught me that in a big way. Yeah, I'm, I'm just learning now about, you know, your relationship with other Black and Indigenous people who are really also responding to the work and, and allowing that to support them and, and supporting you in that process too. Could you talk a little bit about those relationships and also maybe bring us into the, the vision space too around how you envision, I mean, you've talked about how you didn't intend to go so fully into this work. It was kind of a calling or it was a, an inspiration that just kept pulling on you. And so could you yeah. talk about your commitments to other Black and Indigenous women and people and, and how this work is emerging because of them? You're absolutely right. As I said, I, it's not something that I consciously chose to pursue. It was something that kind of found me and, and me and White Supremacy that one night that it all came to me. I mean, my husband and I were talking about this last night and I said, that was really a gift to me. You know, I am a writer and I am a thinker, but that wasn't something I created. It literally came to me. And I can tell the difference between when it's something that I'm trying to work out versus something that just like downloads down into you and you're just taking dictation. And that's exactly what it was like, both in that night and then throughout that month of every day writing those captions for each uh, challenge. Um, and then be- so because it wasn't something that was a long, pl- uh, you know, uh, planned out offering, I hadn't taken the time to consider how it would impact anyone else outside of me. And I certainly hadn't thought about, you know, my, my kind of thing was when I realized this is like going to be really triggering for black indigenous people of color to see these, to see this mass number of white people saying all these things. My number one priority was like, I want everyone, like all the black women who are following me to take care of themselves. Like if they need to unfollow me, they should unfollow me. Like I want them to prioritize themselves. And instead what happened is they came in and really were both, privately behind the scenes and publicly on those posts, holding me and holding, kind of really taking care of me. And then also taking on this like responsibility of we're going to, we're going to support you in this. And that was a huge blessing for me. I really believe that those actions were just like, it just felt like I'm really well taken care of here. And this is really sacred work. It really, really felt sacred. And it gives me chills just thinking about it because I, you know, there were so many people who came in who I didn't even know. They didn't know me. They just somehow found the hashtag and were like, I don't know you, you don't know me, but I just want you to know this is really important what you're doing and we have your back and anything you need, you know, and that was such a, a blessing uh, for me. 
And then beyond that, though, again, seeing and hearing the testimonials of where the work is spreading to and how it's being used in places I could never have imagined. You know, I feel like there was a part of me that did the challenge and was like, okay, I'll write a workbook and then I'll be done with it. That's it. It's going to be the end of it. And then I'll figure out what's next. I don't know what's next, you know, but I'll figure <laughs> out what's next. And, you know, I published the workbook and it just set on fire. Just so many downloads in such a short space of time and hearing about where it was being used and how it was being used. And I, again, felt this great sense of responsibility that, yes, okay, I didn't invent this work. It was given to me. It was a, it was a gift. But I said yes to then sharing it with everyone else. You know, I could have just kept it to myself and thought, oh, that's interesting, you know, and then not shared it and not done the 28 day challenge and not written it into a book. I said yes to doing those things. And that meant saying yes to taking on the responsibility of continuing to, you know, it's kind of like I'm a mother. So it's kind of like having a baby and then not, and then just saying that's the end of it. Like I did the nine months of pregnancy, I did the labor. And now I'm done with it and I can move on with the rest of my life. Like I couldn't, you know, it's, it's, mm. I am responsible for it. Mm. I am responsible for it. And so I finally, you know, had to say, yes, I, I say yes to this responsibility and I take it on and I will protect it and I will take care of it because it's really making such a huge difference in so many different arenas and that there's nothing else like it out there. It's not to say it's the only thing. I, I definitely don't think it's the only thing. It's really such a small part of doing the work of anti-racism and anti-oppression. It has to go hand in hand with so many other things. This is self-reflective work uh, and self-reflective work cannot replace outward action mm. as well. Mm. Um, but, it, but it is an important facet. And so that is what that commitment is. I put something out into the world that creates such a big shift like this. And with the publication of the book now coming, you know, it's my hope that it will reach even more people. I've been really, it's been really amazing. I've been really amazed that it has reached a hundred thousand people. Like that's a lot of people. Like, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around that. Um, and at the same time, I think about what if it reached even more people and what kind of change would that help to create? And that's something that I want to see. And one of my own, personal values and kind of like my personal purpose why I'm here is to help make the world better in some way it's why I was always attracted to doing work around coaching and healing and helping people through personal transformation and when I was doing uh, business coaching I was often working with people who were in those fields and personal growth fields and wellness fields and so it really just is such a huge part of my purpose is doing work that makes a difference in the world and somehow helps to change the world. I just could have never guessed it would have been in the realm of anti-racism. There's this piece too that you bring in, in your podcast, the Good Ancestor podcast, and just the spirit of how you share that is also, to me, feels, how, how do you keep grounded? How do you keep the self-care alive? How do you make sure, and, and, and in your audience too, putting forward that modeling that so that the others on your Instagram and Facebook would also model that self-care, especially Black and Indigenous followers. I think yeah. that's, yeah, just love to hear you talk about that. Yeah. So I talked about how when I initially started talking and having these public, pu public conversations around white supremacy, I didn't have that in mind at all. And I suffered because of it. I ended up burning out. I ended up losing myself, really, and no longer knowing how to show up every day without feeling like, feeling hopeless really, and feeling just really lost in my anger and really lost in the pessimism and really devoid of any kind of hope. And so it was affecting me mentally, emotionally, physically. It was like I had lost myself. And what helped me was working with a mentor. And I, I still work with that mentor. We've been working together. I think it's about almost a year and a half now. And I'll probably be working with her for a very long time to come because that is, that is how I've learned how to stay grounded within myself. It's how I've learned how to really take care of myself. Doing this kind of work, it's very, how do I put this? It's easy to tell other people to do their work, but I also have my own work to do. And in order to maintain the integrity of the work that I'm asking other people to do, I also need to be constantly doing my own work. So white supremacy has affected me just as it affects uh, white people. It just affects me differently. And I have to do the work of 
healing my own internalized oppression that asks me to see myself as less than white people, that asks me to martyr myself for the cause, that asks me to really like put myself last. I've had to do that work and to be continually doing it and to be continually doing my own personal work, which isn't even related to, to race or white supremacy, but just around my own core wounds and my own stories, you know? And so I stay in that work because without it, I've seen the consequences of what happens when I'm not in it. And if I am committed to saying I'm here to carry this work and to be responsible for it for the long term, it's just not an option for me not to be also taking care of myself. It's just not an option. And so that's how I stay grounded. And that's not to say I don't have (laughs) stuff that I continue to be figuring it out. But I do know that having someone who is, you know, supporting me on the journey, guiding me on the journey, holding me accountable to being the kind of woman and a person who's in a position of leadership that I want to be, that that's just not an option not to have it there. Mm. Yeah. Your your work has been so, so helpful uh, for me. I want to move into something that you brought up and I think it was day eight or maybe day 15 of one of your videos where you, you asked your readers and audience to not just give support to leaders with like you with large followings on the online community, but really to live in into what it means to listen to and learn from and and recognize that everyday POC, Black and Indigenous people around them in the cities and towns and regions where your your audience is based. So could you talk a little bit about that and just that to me is something we we, we want to do at, at, on the Next Economy Now podcast too, is to spotlight yeah, not not just people who've been receiving all the airtime, but but really grassroots and and everyday leaders in community. Could you talk yeah. about why that's so important? I think if if someone has been engaging with my work and they, you know, they're like, oh, I love Layla, or I respect her, or her work has been so life changing for me, and they can't recognize Black Indigenous people of color who they say you know, on their street, in their neighborhood, at their school, at their workplace, then I've done something wrong there. Because it's not about continuing to judge everyone else and to treat all the other Black women in your life like they don't matter. That just continues a sort of weird, kind of weird, like celebrity culture thing around this. Um, And that's not what this is about. It's really about creating change in the communities that you're in. And the reason why I I really, it's important for me to highlight that is because I'm not in those communities, right? I live in Qatar in the Middle East. So it would be so easy for someone to say, well, I follow Layla or I do do Layla's work, but I don't engage and I don't go to any anti-racism classes in my city or near my city. I don't sort of know anyone here doing that. We talk about tokenism. So it's kind of like Layla's the token black woman or these these certain people are the token black indigenous people of color that we follow. And other than that, we don't engage with black indigenous people of color. And this work is really about what's happening where you live and where you are, right? So it starts with the internal personal reflection of how does this show up for me? And then you have to start thinking about when it changes on the inside for me, how I see myself, the actions that I'm taking and how I see other black indigenous people of color, then it has to have this ripple out effect of how does this impact the people who I'm either directly coming into contact with or indirectly coming into contact with? Because that's where it has to take place. That's where that change has to take place. It's easy to just stay on social media and kind of be in this little social media bubble. But where it's really going to take place is in person, on the ground, in communities. And so I'd say look for opportunities to be in anti-racism classes in person um, either in your cities or, you know, places, locations that you can get to, I would say it's not, it's also not just about uplifting people who are educators in this work, but re- because a lot of people are not educators in this work. They have no desire to be educators in this work, but they are impacted by white supremacy and they deserve, they deserve your changed behavior and they deserve your, I'm going to use the word allyship, but in quotes, <laughs> because that's, it's a loaded term they are the ones who should be the recipients of the work that you are doing and not just, as you said, giving that attention just to the people who are getting uh, more of the airtime on these kind of platforms. So I really want people as they're doing this work to not just be thinking about how do I think about X, Y, Z 
on Instagram or Facebook, but how do I think about the the people who are at my you know uh, school or in my workplace or in my industry or in my uh, family even? How how am I dealing with them? How am I how is white supremacy showing up in how I relate with them? And that's where the work should be taking place. Mm. Well, as you bring our conversation to a close. What do you need right now, whether it be, you know, requests you have for people in this work of how to hold it, where to focus their energy? What can our listeners do to support you both in in deepening their own personal growth and then also just in supporting the spread of your new book and, you know, where do they find you and follow you and and support your work? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'll answer two ways to personally support me. I invite people to pre-order the book. It's currently open for pre-orders. You can do so at meandwhitesupremacybook.com and it will lead you off to different sites where you can go pre-order the book. That's how, you know, people can support me and my work. But in this kind of, we're thinking more broadly about how to either start or continue the work of anti-racism, depending where you are on your journey. I would say the number one thing is to stay open, to listen, to continue listening, to understand that there are so many different people who are spearheading this work, who are leading this work, who are holding and facilitating this work. Each one of us has our own different ways of doing that. Each, way, each one of us has our own offerings that we're making and each one of us has our own approaches that we take. And one thing that I is just really important for me is that part of doing this work is learning not to tone police people because you don't like the way that the work is presented. So there's certain, certain people who, when they hear my work and sort of interact with me, they really like it, they really feel comfortable, they really feel resonance. And there's other people who feel like I'm too challenging or combative or angry, you know, everyone, we can, you know, every person that we meet, we're experiencing them differently, right? But when we're talking about doing this work, and there are so many different black women, incredible black women who are doing this work, and each one of them has their own different approach. I really want people not to not to start pitting black women against each other in terms of whose approach is better, because all approaches matter, and all approaches are effective. And so I really want people to be open to listening to the different approaches, engaging with the different approaches, realizing that it's going to take all kinds of ways to peel apart this thing we call white supremacy, that there isn't, we're not just using one kind of ax to do it. There's many different ways that we need to do it. Um, And so I really encourage people to listen to all different kinds of teachers, read all different kinds of books, go to all different kinds of classes, listen to all different kinds of voices and just really be with it and let it do its work on you because such a huge part of dismantling white supremacy is learning to realize that there is a different way of thinking that's needed and each person is going to challenge you in a different way to get you into that new way of thinking. So be open and listen to different teachers. Next Economy Now is a production of Lift Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.